This episode comes to you courtesy of the supporters over on Patreon, who voted to learn more about a classic professional wrestler that many modern fans might not be as familiar with as they should be. And when it comes to being classic, well, it's kind of hard to be any more classic than classy, which is exactly what we're going to do, because today... Classy Freddie Blassie is without a doubt one of the all-time greats of professional wrestling, and while I would love to just dive on in and give you some bullet points as to what made him so great, I think it doesn't work quite as well unless you get the proper backstory and the proper context in order to give you perspective. And with that being said, who do I know that's capable of giving a proper wrestling biography? Well, I think we all know the answer to that. So, without further ado, allow me to welcome back to the show the amazing Ryan from Wrestling Bios, who has graciously agreed to help me out with today's episode. Thanks so much, Ryan, and take it away. Hey, Dave, thanks so much for having me back on your channel. So, classy Freddy Blassie, what a character he was, and what a great subject to make a video on. Freddy's parents immigrated to the United States from Germany just before the First World War, and Frederick Kenneth Blassie was born on February 8th, 1918 in St. Louis. Blassie had a rough childhood. He would often stay with his grandparents due to the actions of his abusive alcoholic father, and because of the things Blassie witnessed at home, he wouldn't touch a drop of alcohol throughout his entire life. As a teenager, Blassie took up boxing and he proved to be successful, but he had a real keen interest in wrestling. Now, the wrestling that Freddie Blassie fell in love with was not the same as the professional wrestling you see today, no no. Blassie enjoyed watching the shooters and the practitioners of catch wrestling. Blassie said the shooters noticed Freddie taking an interest in wrestling and they kinda took Blassie under their wing. Freddy says that his very first wrestling match was actually a shoot fight that he accepted because he wanted to impress a girl that he brought to a show. Eventually, Blassie got work with promoters in the St. Louis and Kansas City areas before enlisting in the Navy as the United States entered World War II. When Fred returned from the war, he was billed as Sailor Freddy Blassie, but the gimmick was unsuccessful. It wasn't until he went to Georgia in 1952 where he would become a full-blown heel, and boy, what a heel Freddy Blassie was. Dyeing his hair blonde and dubbing himself the Hollywood fashion plate, Blassie would go on to become a must-see wrestling villain that makes today's bad guys look like cute little puppy dogs. Freddy has told stories of fans trying to stab him, fans throwing acid over him, the guy at times needed police to bring him to and from the ring, death threats were frequent, classy Freddy Blassie knew how to get heat and he didn't hold back. Now Blassie was known for exaggerating a story or two, maybe making 100 Japanese fans drop dead from heart attacks due to seeing Freddy and all his brutal glory was a bit of a stretch, but this all added to the legend of classy Freddy Blassie. There's even stories of Bruno Sammartino's saving Freddy Blassie from the Mafia. Really incredible stuff that you want to believe is true due to how insane it all is. Decades spent in the ring led to Blassie becoming one of wrestling's most hated bad guys. The self-proclaimed king of men would call his opponents pencil neck geeks while bringing fans to their boiling point. Though as the years went on, Blassie would be one of the very first men to transcend the wrestling business by appearing in other forms of media, from TV shows and movies to releasing his own albums. Back in the ring, Blassie was no stranger to championship gold with over 40 title reigns spanning over his entire career, 17 of which being the Georgia version of the NWA Southern Heavyweight Championship. California law stated at the time that anyone over the age of 55 was prohibited from getting a wrestling license. This was back in 1974. Because of this, Blassie would become a manager, and Blassie would become one of the great managers of the New York Territory, or the WWWAF. Blassie, the Grand Wizard, and Captain Lou would get named the three wise men of the East, the top three heel managers of New York. Blassie's clients included legends like Peter Maivia, Jesse Ventura, The Iron Sheet, George the Animal Steel and the Immortal Hulk Hogan. Blassie even managed Muhammad Ali during the infamous 1976 Boxer vs Wrestler match featuring Ali and Antonio Inoki. A friendship blossomed between Blassie and Ali, leading to Blassie representing the champ for media events during the mid-1970s. 
But I've blobbered on long enough here, so I'm going to pass it back over to Dave, and I'm sure Dave is going to knock this one out of the park while explaining what made Freddie Blassie so special. Blassie was a lot of things. He was a man's man, a pro's pro, the man you love to hate. He was an incredible entertainer with a life that would make an incredible Hollywood movie. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll take the time to research the career of classy Freddie Blassie. Enjoy the rest of this video, and again, thank you for for having me. Thank you so much to Ryan for doing such an awesome job covering the life of Freddie Blassie. And if you like getting in-depth biographical looks at some of your favorite wrestlers, as well as re-examining some events of wrestling history, such as the Monday Night Wars week to week, then go over to Ryan's channel, Wrestling Bios, and tell him Dave sent you. Thanks again, Ryan, for the help, and without further ado, let's get back into the episode. When it comes to classy Freddie Blassie, the reason why many people should know who he is is because he's pretty much done it all. And what do I mean by all? Well, I mean he's done a lot of things that professional wrestling today sorely lacks. But in addition to that, he has also done a lot of things that modern fans just love, proving that you can indeed have your cake and eat it too. Like AJ Styles and Kenny Omega, Blassie spent a fair amount of time wrestling in Japan. However, unlike other wrestlers such as Carl Gotch, Stan Hansen, or even Hulk Hogan, for some reason, a lot of Blassie's contributions aren't really mentioned all that much. In 1962, Blassie went over to Japan and went against Ricky Dozen, the creator of Japanese pro wrestling. At the time, Blassie was the WWA World Heavyweight Champion and was gracious enough to put his title on the line against the founding father of Porasu, which was a decent enough rub. But Blassie decided to go one step further, not just putting the belt up for grabs, but also losing it to Ricky Dozen. This worked to not only establish the wrestler, but it also helped to establish all of Japanese pro wrestling and give it some credibility. Now, the Ricky Dozen feud was definitely not the only wrestling that Blassie would do while he was in Japan, as he would stick around for a few years during the 1960s. And while he was there, he would meet a Japanese woman, who would later become his wife. Now, at first, her parents didn't approve of Blassie, specifically because of his rematch that he had against Ricky Dozen. But, that leads me to... Blassie was no stranger to the ultra-violence, and one great example of this would be his rematch that he had against Ricky Dozen where he regained the WWA World Heavyweight title. For you see, Freddy wasn't playing this time around, and he bit Ricky Dozen's head so hard that he drew blood. This is that incident that Ryan was alluding to earlier. Now again, whether or not any of these claims are actually true is anybody's guess. Although, I do have to specify that there are real reports of actual coronary episodes happening due to this match. Now, another report a consequence of the sheer brutality behind this bout was that Blassie's eventual wife's parents didn't want her to marry the man that they saw ravage Ricky Dozen on national television. However, they eventually did come around. By the way, this tactic of biting was not a new feature in Freddy's arsenal. Blassie was notorious for drawing blood, being regarded as an extreme wrestler, and being known for getting and giving color in his matches, with his teeth being his favorite way to deliver the hard way. Freddy was definitely more than just Japanese wrestling in blood, because he could also work a gimmick like nobody's business. And yes, as Ryan pointed out, his early sailor gimmick didn't land quite as well as some would have hoped. But nevertheless, his time as the Hollywood fashion plate or the king of men is exactly where he made his name. He was also billed at one point as the vampire, due to him filing his teeth in order to better open up his opponents. And right there, it's like having the gimmicks of Gangrel, Tyler Breeze, Tugboat, Jerry Lawler, and Buddy Rogers all rolled into one amazing wrestling career. Now, this can't be stated enough, but Blassie was the archetypal heel. While many modern fans might think of him as the grumpy grandpa who just called everyone pencil neck geeks, Blassie did way more than that to get heat. His ability to really dig into the audience and find that button that triggers fans and then just keep on pushing was truly astounding. Blassie was capable of getting heat anywhere he went. For example, there was one promo he cut where he said that the women of Los Angeles were nothing but pigs, and suggested that they wear something, uh, more attuned to his liking, shall we say. And when he was told that he was going a bit too far, Blassie simply replied, What do I care? The only women I'm gonna lose are the pigs that I'm talking about. All the beautiful women are still gonna want me anyway. 
Now, what's true for a lot of modern heels, where they eventually get over for their antics, was also true for Blassie as well, as he did eventually become babyface. But don't get me wrong, he was still capable of going full on rogue anytime he wanted to. And also, Blassie was just so good at being a heel that allegedly he was the reason why Regis Philbin turned into a celebrity. During the beginning of Regis's career as a talk show host, Blassie would show up and antagonize the audience, throw furniture, and even threaten to beat up the host. And if this is true and that's what made Regis's career, well, I guess that does explain why he was always so good to wrestling. Oh, and also, for fans who really enjoyed The Rock talking in the third person, well, just know that Blassie did do it first on occasion before Rocky Maivia ever stepped foot in the ring. But this is not to say that Classy Freddy Blassie invented everything in the heel playbook because he definitely didn't. But the reason why he was so effective is because he was able to take what his predecessors did and make it his own. For instance, when Blassie started wrestling in Atlanta, he was booed because they viewed him as being a Yankee, but instead of trying to counteract this heat wave, Blassie decided to run with it. He began playing up the city slicker snob angle and dyeing his hair like Gorgeous George and Buddy Rogers before him, but he managed to set himself apart by really emphasizing his skills as a professional wrestler and also by filing his teeth. In other words, he was a pretty boy who was also tough somehow. While I'm on the subject of being a tough guy, let's remember that Freddy could definitely shoot. Between his military training and his rough upbringing, Blassie was no stranger to legit fighting. So, when we look at all the MMA influence that some are trying to inject into professional wrestling these days, being a skilled boxer was the equivalent for the time. Oh, and speaking of the times... Despite him playing the part of a bad guy, when it came to real life, Blassie showed how he felt about racial equality. Not only did he marry a Japanese woman, but his first wife was Jewish, which happened around World War II and was a difficult time for the Blassie family. As Ryan stated earlier, Blassie's family immigrated from Germany, and during World War II they were accused of being un-American, which was definitely not the case. And on top of this, Ricky Dozen wasn't the only POC that Blassie would do the favors for, as he also lost the Worldwide Wrestling Associates Championship to African-American wrestler Bearcat Wright, just a mere five days before Martin Luther King's historic I Have a Dream speech. And while this might not seem like a big deal now, keep in mind that this was happening during the Civil Rights Movement and was a big gesture as far as professional wrestling was concerned, especially when you consider how long it took WWE to follow suit. And lastly, I just have to mention how Classy Freddy Blassie is one of the all-time great managers. Now, his managerial prowess could easily get a video all onto itself, especially since that is how I remember him, so I'm only going to briefly mention it here. However, it can't be overstated enough that Blassie really did set the template for many great heel managers that would follow in his footsteps. He was in many ways a proto heenan if you will, not to mention, if you remember the picture I showed you earlier, well, not sure if you caught it, but that was a young Paul Heyman standing with the three Wiseman. Just something else to keep in mind. Well, there you go. Just some of the reasons why Classy Freddy Blassie was so great. But what are some of your favorite stories about the Classy One? Let me know down in the comments. And don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up if you liked it, as well as subscribing to this channel. And also another big thank you to Wrestling Bios for all the help in making this video. And as for you, thank you so much for watching, and thank you to my Patreon supporters. And as always, Dave knows.